today is the last installment of my two-week series called Marked. And this word marked is something that I felt like God dropped in my heart concerning the fruit of the Spirit. We were talking about the fruit of the Spirit, but we're going to go a little different way today with this series, okay? How many of you like James Bond movies? Does anybody like James Bond movies, right? My name is James, James Bond, right? We like these clandestine movies, these super action stars, and, and maybe you don't know anything about James Bond because that's, you know, it's a little not, not... How about Jason Bourne? Does anybody like Jason Bourne movies, right? Did you hear about the new movie that's coming out with Jason? It's called Born Again. <laughs> Just kidding. Jason gets... Oh, never mind, never mind. <laughs> What is it that we like about these movies? Well, it's because it's this special agent, about this one special agent in this clandestine agency, and this guy's a machine. If nobody else can get it done, he can get it done. And we get to focus on him, and it's amazing how it works because he can run through a barrage of gunfire, machine guns, and the, the wall behind him will explode, but somehow he squeezed between every bullet, but if anybody's standing next to him, they fall down. Have you ever noticed that? It'd be kind of like you going out to your car, it's pouring down rain, you and another person are at the mall, you're running to the car, right? You don't have an umbrella, you get in the car, the person next to you is, is completely dry and you're soaking wet. You say, what happened? You say, well, I ran between the raindrops. How do you know you can't run between raindrops? He looked at me like, really? That happens? No, you can't run between raindrops any more than you can avoid a barrage of bullets. But we go to the movies and we believe it. Come on, somebody. We know Jason. We know that James is going to live every single time. And you know in those movies, the good guy always wins. Why? Because he's going after the most evil person on the planet who's trying to blow up the world. And what they call that guy is an assassin who's taking out a mark. The person he's taking out is a mark, or he's marked for death. Did, did you know that before you found Jesus Christ, you were a mark? You were marked by the enemy. And just like they're this evil person in the movie, you were an evil person. Look at the person next to you and say, he's talking to you. Tell him he's talking to you. You were an evil person. Before Jesus came into your life, your lifestyle, the way you spoke, the things that you did, the places you went, the people you hung out with, the, the addictions, the habits that you had were evil. But when Jesus came in your life, I don't know if you know, he erased that mark and he gave you a new mark. And you became marked as a good person based upon what Jesus did for you. As a matter of fact, you used to be marked or targeted as somebody who was lost. But when Jesus came in your life, you were targeted as found. Come on, how many of you are found in Jesus' name? And so as we talk about this word marked, last week I brought out the, the scripture, uh, Psalm 37, 37. And I told you this is kind of one of my life scriptures because my mother, I'm the youngest of nine, and so my mother had to buy everything in nines, nine pairs of shoes nine pairs of jeans, nine jackets, nine bicycles, nine this, nine that, nine meals, everything was nine. Well, when she got born again, when she received Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior, she bought everybody in the family a plaque. I don't know, some of you may have gotten these with your name on it, with what it meant in Scripture, and then it had a, a Scripture underneath of it to, to say that you were a Christian. Well, my name is Edward, and the meaning of my name is Prosperous Guardian. That's the meaning of my name. And then the scripture that was connected to it, we shared last week over in Psalm 37, 37, mark the perfect man and behold the upright, for the end of that man is peace. You know what I love about this scripture? Is God doesn't care about your beginning, he cares about your end. How many of you are glad he's not looking at yesterday, but he's looking at your today? And so here it talks about you being marked. You're marked because you've become perfect in Christ, not perfect in yourself. Because every day we fail. Come on, somebody. Every day we fail, but in Christ, we are marked perfect. And in light of the current health challenges that we're in the middle of, I've adapted this message marked, which we were actually talking about the fruit of the Spirit last week, to marked. You ready for this? It's what you said to each other earlier. Flu can't touch this. You can't touch this. Touch this. Point at somebody, tell them. You can't touch this. 
One more time. Here we go. Can't touch this. Come on, somebody. Flu. Can't touch this. So we're going to catch up with Jesus when he was just 12 years old over in the book of Luke chapter 2. Look what it says in verse 42. When Jesus was 12 years old, he accompanied his parents to Jerusalem for an annual Passover festival, which they attended each year. I want you to catch the words in there I've highlighted. Number one, Passover. Number two, each year, and then they, that he stayed behind. So first of all, they went to a festival called Passover. And that Passover was every year. So he was 12 years old. He had been going to that Passover for at least 10 years, maybe 11. I don't know if he went when he was a newborn, but they went every year, okay? And it says that after the celebration was over, they went home to Nazareth, but Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. Now, any parents in here got a problem with your 12-year-old uh, staying behind in Florida while you're coming back to D.C.? What are you doing, right? You go with us. And look what it says. His parents didn't miss him. Of course they didn't. Everybody wants to get rid of that 12-year-old. Um, his parents didn't miss him <coughs> the first day, for they assumed he was with friends among the other travelers because they were walking. So they figured he was among the group that was walking, okay? But when he didn't show up that evening, they started to look for him among their relatives and friends. And when they couldn't find him, they went back to Jerusalem. Okay, parents, you had to walk back one day. I don't know if you know the fruit of the Spirit are being worked on right now because you're having to walk back a whole day to find that kid. Look what it says. And they went back to Jerusalem and searched for him there. Look, three days later, oh, they finally discovered him. He was in the temple sitting among the teachers of the law discussing deep questions with them, amazing everyone with his understanding and answers. Think about what he was doing. His parents didn't know what to think. His mom says, son, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been frantically searching for you everywhere. Now I'm hoping that these next few words will change you a little bit. Look at Jesus' answer. He says, why did you need to search? First of all, I did stay behind. What would you think? I was down at the vape shop? Did you think I was uh, stealing oranges down there at the market? I mean, where were you looking for me? Isn't that interesting? Why, why did it take you three days to find me? Why, why did you need to search? Didn't you realize I would be here at Summit? I'd be here in my father's house? He's saying... Don't you know who I am? And you say, well, how would they know? Well, you do realize on Jesus' birthday, everybody gets presents. And you do realize that they were in this little town called Bethlehem, in this dark place, and nobody really knew they were there. And when Jesus was born, the heavens erupted with a pate. All of the angels erupted in singing. The, the shepherds came running. There was this amazing moment. How many of you know his parents knew exactly who he was and that they knew he probably wasn't vaping? And what he was saying was, don't you know, who, what did you think I would be doing? Where would be the first place you would look for Jesus? And he's saying, this is where I'd be. And I just want to take a side note. How many of you would like that to be your reputation? That if we came looking for you, we'd find you with the Lord. And this is what he's saying. Didn't you realize this is where I would be? But remember why he's there. He's at the Passover feast. And now he's walking around. He's very familiar with everything. He's been going for years. It said they went every year. But 12 years old, all of a sudden he stays behind. Not out of disobedience. Not because he was being ugly to his parents. Because something changed in him at 12 years old. And so every year for the past 35 years, thousand years. I want you to think about that. Or 3,500 years. 3,500 years since the time of Moses to today. The Jews have celebrated a festival called Passover. And this is exactly where we find Jesus and his parents in this passage. We find them celebrating Passover. 
But at this point, it had been going on for 1,500 years. It had been celebrated every year for 1,500 years, which if you add from the time of Jesus to today, 2,000 years, you get 3,500 years because the Jews still celebrate what they call the Seder dinner or the Passover dinner today. They are still celebrating it today. Passover dinner was um, a commemoration of Israel's deliverance from slavery in Egypt. So they, does anybody remember the, the movie, The Ten Commandments, Cecil B. DeMille? You remember that? It was 1920, or no, 1956. It was, does anybody remember this movie? Three hours and 15 minutes of watching a movie. I mean, literally, your birthday would come and go while the movie was going on. It was a huge event, and, and if you're my age and you watch this, you remembered it was a big deal. Every year it came on. You sat down, and man, it is Ten Commandments time, right? It was so important. And so from the time of Moses to the time of Jesus, that day called Passover had been celebrated for 1,500 years. And so it was something that was commemorated every single year. And then the story, we know that, that um, Israel was delivered from bondage or from slavery out of Egypt. In the book of e uh, Exodus, we hear the Jews crying out to God for freedom. They're praying, and they'd been in, they had been in um, bondage for 400 years. How many generations is that? 400 years had been in bondage. But Pharaoh... After sending Moses to Pharaoh, Pharaoh would not let them go. And the Bible says he went seven times to Pharaoh. And every time Pharaoh said no, or he would say yes, but he wouldn't do it. So he would lie. And if anybody knows the story of the Ten Commandments, we know that when Moses would go, he said, let my people go. And when Pharaoh didn't, what happened? A plague would come. Different plagues would come. One of the plagues was, you ready for this, ladies? One of the plagues was, was frogs. He sent millions of frogs into the land to where they were in their beds, they were in their ceilings, they were in their bathtubs. It didn't matter where they went, there were frogs. Ladies, is that a curse or what? I mean, you go to put your boots on, rip it. You know, I mean, frogs everywhere. That was one of the curses. Well, God had given him seven opportunities to let the people go, and he didn't do it. And he said to Moses, he said, well, I'm, he said, one last plague. He's not, he's not listening. He said, the last plague is, I'm going to send the death angel. And the death angel is going to overshadow all of Egypt. And the firstborn of every animal and the firstborn of every Egyptian will die. Because Pharaoh will not let my people go. But something God wanted to do when the death angel came, he, he would have no partiality. He wanted to make sure that the Jews or the Hebrew children were protected. So let's pick up that story in Exodus chapter 12. It says, The Lord said to Moses and to Aaron in the land of Egypt, This will be the first month and the first day of the new year. And on this day, I want you to tell the Israelite community that on the tenth day, from this day forward, in 10 days, they must take a lamb for each household, a lamb per house. You should divide the lamb in proportion to the number of people who will be eating it. Your lamb will be a flawless year-old male. You should keep close watch over it until the 14th day of this month. And at twilight on that day, the whole Israelite community should slaughter their lamb. They should take some of the blood... And smear it on the two doorposts and the beam over the door of the houses in which they are eating. If this drum cage was a door, a large door obviously, and the hinges were on this side and the strike was on this side where the door handle strikes, there are two sides of that door, we call them the door jams. The Bible says that they were to take this lamb and they were to shed its blood and divide it up to cook it and take some of the blood and strike it on either side of the doorpost and on the header over top of the door and they were to use a hyssop tree the wood of a hyssop tree and they weren't supposed to do it any other way that this is what God wanted them to do it's the Passover of the Lord I'll pass through the land of Egypt that night and I'll strike down every oldest child in the land of Egypt both humans and animals I'll impose judgment on the, all the gods of Egypt the blood will be your sign 
on the houses and where you live. I don't want you to hear this. Whenever I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will destroy you. When I strike the land of Egypt, and this will be a day of remembering for you. You will observe it as a festival to the Lord. And I want you to see this. Your descendants will honor the Lord with this festival. What's the next word? Another translation says, from generation to generation, you are to celebrate it by perpetual regulation. So let's fast forward to 12-year-old Jesus. This is why we find Joseph and Mary and Jesus in Jerusalem celebrating the Passover. They're celebrating what we just heard, that the Jews who were in captivity for 400 years, God overnight delivered them that the next day when they rose, the seven plagues did not get Pharaoh's intention until his firstborn son was dead. He knew it wasn't Moses who went through the land. He knew there had to have been a God fighting on Moses' behalf. And he said, get these people out of here. And they were, they were slaves one day, and they were free men the next. And I don't know about you. I was a slave one day, and I was a free man the next. What happened in between being a slave and being a free man? The blood of the Lamb had been shed. And what protected them from the death angel? The blood of the lamb. And the Bible says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And look what it says. And no plague will destroy you. So we see Joseph and Mary. They're celebrating this 1,500 years later. This has been celebrated now 1,500 times, and Jesus is there. Why? Because it's a requirement. How many of you can see it was a requirement for them to be there? But something took place different this time. Of all the times that they went until he was 12 years old, something took place different. Jesus stayed behind. He obviously had never stayed behind before because they assumed he was traveling with other people. Isn't that right? It was the first time in 12 years Jesus had ever booked it. And so they go back looking for him. And what does he say? What are you looking for me for? And what Jesus did on his 12th birthday while he was there at that particular time, he looked around all of the familiar sights and sounds, and all of a sudden he went, this is about me. The lamb that Moses was instructed, I'm him. All of a sudden, he became aware of who he was. He didn't stay behind out of disobedience. He stayed behind out of obligation to his call. And that's why he said, why are you looking for me at the vape shop? Didn't you know I'd be right here? And in that realization, he began to become the lamb. And so in John chapter 1, verse 25, it says this, that, that John had, had um, come on the scene, and all of a sudden, the, the Pharisees were not getting the attention that they used to, were used to getting. They, they were all of a sudden not being celebrated in the city. Why? Because John the baptizer was out at the Jordan and his ministry was attracting the entire city. Now, how many of you know you're popular when the entire city goes? And they were shutting down stores and the, the Pharisees were used to walking out of their homes and their robes with the bells on the bottom of their robes and, and, and looking very good and, and, and they were hand sanitized and they were ready for the day. And as they walked out, the streets were empty. Now, how many of you know it's hard to have, get dressed up for a party when no one's at the party to celebrate your new outfit? And they were getting upset, and they realized the whole city had emptied out. Tens of thousands of people were going to the Jordan River. And so they went down to the Jordan River, and they see all these people, and they're getting upset because the tension's not on them anymore. But people are coming to the river, and they're being baptized in the water, and they're repenting of their sins, and revival is happening and instead of them rejoicing over people's revival, they were getting upset because they had lost their attention. And so they went to John and they said to him, who do you think you are? Who gives you the authority and the power to baptize and to forgive? 
And then we pick the story up here in John chapter 1, verse 25. John answered, I baptized with water, but someone greater stands among you whom you don't recognize. He comes after me, but I am not worthy to untie his sandal straps. Now, what do you think they were thinking when they looked at John, who was attracting tens and tens and tens of thousands of people? He was emptying whole cities. And he says, you know what? There's someone coming who's bigger than me. They were thinking, what's this guy like? And he says, I'm not even worthy to touch his shoes. He says, this encounter took place across the Jordan in Bethany where John was baptizing. Look what happens. The next day, the very next day after John said that, John saw Jesus coming towards him and he said, look. And somebody read those, three, those four words. One, two, three. See, Jesus was at the Passover when he was 12 years old, and he knew it was about the Passover lamb, and all of a sudden he realized something. I'm going to be sacrificed. And John sees Jesus coming, and he identifies him not as the man of God, not as the son of God, not as a mighty healer, not about anything. He identifies him as what? What does he identify him as? The the Lamb of God, who what? Takes away the sins of the world. That means everything that we had are going to be laid on that Lamb because that Lamb is going to carry away through its sacrificial act everything that we've done wrong. Look what he says. He said, this is the one whom I said. He who comes after me is really greater than me because he existed before me. I didn't even recognize him. Now what was he saying about that? Jesus and, and John were cousins. And John was six months older than Jesus, so we know that Jesus and John used to hang out as kids and play Roman soldiers. They used to have hummus together at lunchtime and eat falafel. They knew each other growing up. And so he's baptizing, and Jesus comes over the hill, who he knows very well. But today he sees something different. He says, in his mind he goes, no way, little Jay? Are you kidding me? Little Jay, the lamb, man. I didn't recognize him. But today my eyes have been opened. How many of you thank God for the day your eyes opened up to who Jay is? The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He existed. He said, I came before him six months. But he existed before I ever existed. I came baptizing with water so he might be known to Israel. He knew his whole purpose in baptism was to draw Jesus out of the hundreds of thousands of people who were coming. He knew one day his eyes were going to be open. He just couldn't believe it was little Jay. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the flawless, sinless Lamb that the book of Exodus represented, that same Lamb that first lamb that Moses, see God started a brand new year. He gave them a brand new life. He delivered them out of bondage. He was giving them peace, joy. He was giving them wealth. He was taking care of them. He was splitting the Red Sea and causing miracles to happen to get them to their destination. It all began with a lamb. And your life where God splits the Red Sea for you. And your life where he sets you free and gets you out of your bondages and gives you a new life. All begins with a lamb. The last and final lamb that takes away the sins of the world. Jesus Christ, this beautiful, flawless lamb. The Passover lamb represents deliverance from the past into a new life. Deliverance from bondage and sin and slavery. The Passover lamb had to die and shed its blood so it could be struck on each side of the doorpost. Why? So that death would pass over so that the plague would pass over look at the person next to you say flu can't touch this how do you thank God for the blood of Jesus that's forgiven you you see you're marked you see the doorpost was marked the header was marked and when the when the angel came over the, of death they were singing in there can't touch this can't touch this 
And it wasn't they were saying, you can't touch this because of us. They were saying, you can't touch me because of the blood. So as we fast forward, Jesus was 12 years old celebrating. Now he's 33 years old. We're 33 years ahead. The festival of unleavened bread called the Passover was approaching. Do you remember when we were reading back there in Exodus, I made you repeat unleavened bread? Do you remember that? That's because I wanted you to see that the Jews had transitioned the Passover festival to the Passover of unleavened bread, but it was the same Passover. How many of you can see that? I wanted to make sure you saw that. Passover represents the unleavened bread, the bitter herbs, and it represents the lamb. Okay? It was fast approaching and the chief priests were looking for a way to kill Jesus. Isn't it weird that on Passover they were looking to kill the lamb? Come on, somebody. It'll preach, won't it? The chief priests were looking for a way to kill Jesus. Then Satan entered Judas, who was one of the twelve. And he discussed with the chief priests and the officers of the temple guard how he could hand Jesus over to him. And he agreed and began looking for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them. And the day of unleavened bread had arrived when the Passover had to be sacrificed. And Jesus sent Peter and John with the task to go prepare the Passover meal. Now Jesus had been in the ministry for three and a half years. He had had at least three, maybe two, Passover meals with his team. He'd already had it twice. So this was nothing new to them. You go, go, go get that meal ready, boys. We've done this before. You know what to do. They go and prepare. And it says, once the meal was ready, Jesus sat down to eat. And the apostles joined him. And he said to them, are you ready for this? Here we go. Shift. Everybody say shift. Look what he says. I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you. 33 years this man's been eating Passover. He's been going to Jerusalem. We catch him at 12 years old. We see his eyes are open to who he is. He begins to live that out. John says, look, it's the Lamb of God. He realizes who he is, but yet this is his last and final Passover meal. We call it the Last Supper because within 12 hours of this statement, that man, the Lamb of God, is going to be hanging on a cross. And he's going to be shedding his blood. Come on, somebody. So that you and I would be marked. He said, I've been waiting. I've had this meal for 30 years. And I've been waiting for this one. And after giving thanks for the bread, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way he took the cup. And he said, this is the, the new covenant of my blood, which will be poured out for you. Because God said, when I see the blood, I'm going to pass over. No plague. No guilt. Not because of you, but because of the blood. Who can believe our report? Isaiah 53. And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Do you know there was a time when Jesus walked the earth and he healed the sick? How many of you know that he healed the sick? How many of you know he opened the eyes of the blind? How many of you know he called the lame to walk? He called the blind to see? How many of you know he called leper skin to be made completely new like baby skin? And the Bible says one day he was casting devils out. How many of you know he would cast Satan out? And they came to him and said, you're casting Satan out by the power of Satan. And he said, a house divided can't stand. I don't cast out Satan by the power of Satan. He said, I cast out Satan with the finger of God. So if there is that much power in the finger of God that every devil in hell is subject to him, what happens when God starts rolling his sleeve up? You know, like somebody says something to my wife, and I say, yep. Yeah. You know, I've been training for this all my life. Usually when a man starts rolling his sleeve up, one of two things is about to happen. 
either some really hard work or a beat down. And the Bible says, to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And it says he grew up like a young plant before us. It's describing who the arm of the Lord is. The young plant is Jesus. And look what it says, like a root from dry ground. That's a reference to the virgin birth. He was despised and avoided by others. He was a man who suffered and knew sickness well. People hid their faces from him and he was despised and rejected. It was our sickness. Now, you see, go back one script, go back one scripture real quick. It says, he knew sickness well. And if you read that, you might think, well, he must have been sick. No, we're going to find out why he knew sickness well. Next scripture, please. It says it was whose sickness? His sickness? Our sickness that he carried. He wasn't sick. He knew sickness well because he dealt with sickness. He knew what it mean for people who were suffering, suffering humanity and humanity who was hurting and, and in their own humanity couldn't get free and there weren't the, the technology and the doctors that they had today and it says our sickness that he carried, our sufferings that he bore, but we thought, we thought the sickness and sufferings were God striking him down and tormenting him. But he was pierced because of our rebellions. He was crushed because of our crimes. And he bore the punishment. Are you ready for this? He bore the punishment that made us whole. And by his wounds, we are, come on, somebody shout it out, healed. My closing statement is from Billy Graham. He said this. The blood of the lamb applied over the doorposts on the night of Israel's deliverance from Egypt distinguished obedient from disobedient. Those who did it were protected. Those who didn't were not protected. Just so today, the applied blood of the lamb of God is a distinguishing what? Mark of God's called out ones, the church. How many of you are the church today? 